Come in. We have room for one more. <laughs> All right. Thank you uh, for the prayer, Ronnie. Yes. Sir. Uh, okay. Let's look at this introduction. We're going to be looking at in Second Thessalonians chapter two, and twelve verses is what's in the lesson. <clears throat> and uh, those twelve verses are really, really important, incredibly important. And there's things here in this chapter or the the lesson tonight that you won't find anywhere else in the in the New Testament except the book of Revelation. In fact, what Paul talks about here has it, it will mesh with a great deal of the book of Revelation. So I even mentioned some of the Revelation in here, trying to make the connections. <clears throat> and also the book of Daniel, of course. When you go to Revelation, you've got to do that. So let me, let me go into this, this introduction because it kind of helps us uh, see where we are uh, on the outline. The Thessalonians thought that their sufferings, that would be in that first chapter, that their sufferings meant that the day of the Lord had arrived. And at the end time period of worldwide judgment, and that's Revelation 6 through 19, is when the world comes under the judgment of God. Revelation 6 through 19. They thought they had come into that. And, uh, and so they realized that, <clears throat> that he might be soon coming and his kingdom was about to be set up on the earth, but at that time of trouble would come first. And so here Paul pleads against this mistake. It is a mistake. By citing again the truth that Christ's coming would be before the day of the Lord. Uh, teaching which he had outlined in the first epistle. In uh, chapter 4 of the first epistle, of verses 13 through 18, we talked about the rapture. But Paul's already taught them those things. And so, and that, that and little bit of introduction is from, at first asterisk means uh, Bible, Unger's Bible handbook. And just, that's something he had to say. And then the next part of that introduction, the great object of this second epistle is to recover the hope that they had lost. Now, Ronnie prayed about that a moment ago in his prayer, you know, having hope. Uh, now, about if faith, hope, and love, those three virtues. And so when Paul talks to the Thessalonians in this epistle, he talked about their faith. Remember last time? He talked about their faith and their love. But he doesn't say anything about their hope because somebody's taking their hope away from them. When, if, you, if you believe you're in the tribulation, your hope's been taken away from. And so that's what they've been taught or they've been led to believe. And so the great object of this second epistle then is to recover the hope that they had lost. And it was written in the interest of that blessed hope of our gap being gathered together unto the Lord so that they might wait for God's Son from heaven as they had done in the past. Okay. Uh, come on in, doctor. Uh, you're doing good. All right, so uh, the first part of this, let's just go right into verse 1. And I've titled this part, Be Not Soon Shaken. And I put that on the board. Be Not Soon Shaken. That's his message to them. Be Not Soon Shaken. They're troubled, they're shaken, they're upset, they have not been left any hope. And uh, that's a great lesson because in our day, and you mentioned in your prayer, if we don't give people the hope, I'm talking about God's blessed hope, then they don't have anything to deal with in the world today because the world, one of the things we learn from this lesson, and we learn it from Jesus, we learn it from Paul, especially in this lesson where we talk about the Antichrist. The world will be characterized by great deception. Great deception is abounding, even today. I mean, when I was teaching in college, I used to ask my students, who's telling you the truth? Who's telling you the truth? And I guarantee you, who's telling you the truth? In anything in the world today, we're being deceived. And so, who's telling you the truth? Well, we have the truth. Now, God's Word is truth. And when we go back to it, that's the only guaranteed truth that we have and the truth the scripture says the truth is in Jesus all right he says I am the way the truth and the life and so the truth is in Jesus Christ 
And so everything's about him in some ways, opening up to us the heavenly plan and where Jesus is all in all. And he is our life. So we begin. So Paul says in verse 1, he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now that phrase, gathering together unto him, what does that refer to? First Thessalonians 4. And it's the rapture. It's when we were going to be gathered up. We're going to be gathered together unto him. And that's that he introduces that subject. Now the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's a that's a term that can be used different ways. It can be it can be used for the rapture, his coming for his own. Or it can be used for his coming in judgment. And that would be the second advent. So we've got to do this again. Uh, you know. Is our church age, and we'll pay, pay attention to this as we go through. And then the, it ends, the church age will end with a rapture. And uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. And then right after that, somewhere in here, there could be, and John, you and I talked about this, there can be this overlap. There can be an overlap. And as I studied more from a lot of the different commentaries and theologians, uh, some people have even larger overlaps than what I might have thought. But we know that the tribulation itself is defined by Daniel for seven years. We know that we know that from Daniel. And we also know that from the book of Revelation because it says the same thing. Revelation says the same thing that Daniel says. So we know there's a great tribula there's a there's a tribulation coming on the earth. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's called a day of wrath, a day of uh, judgment, a day of darkness. It's the beginning of it, is that darkness. And then there's going to be light. Because the Lord comes back right here. The second advent is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In judgment. See, because there's going to be judgment here. Right here. Toward the end of this. Right in here. And then you see he sets up his kingdom over here. Very clear. The kingdom is set up and that's called the glory. And we think of the glory, we think of the suffering over here, right? He died on the cross. The suffering and the glory that would follow. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 11. Uh, the suffering and the glory that should follow. So that's where we are. And so these Thessalonians have been told, somebody told them, some false teacher, or they came up with on their own, that they must be over in this troubling time because of their persecution and because of the suffering that they were uh, enduring. And so they thought they were over in here. And Paul says, no, 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 no. And so he, this is his message to them. Be not soon shaken. You're not over here. This is called the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord starts off in a very gloom, a, a judgment of God right here. And when God intervenes directly in the world system. Now, the Satan has, has worked his world system so that he's fully... Uh, implemented his world system right in here. And then that system will be taken out and be destroyed. And so the day of the Lord starts with that. It ends right here with a certain judgments, a lot of different judgments. And then the kingdom. And so the day of the Lord proceeds right on over here to into this kingdom. And, and it goes all the way even to uh, Revelation 20. The new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem. That's, that's all part of the day of the Lord. So that can be, you know, really bright things about the day of the Lord. But at the beginning of it, it's not dark. I mean, it's not bright. It's dark. It's the wrath of God. It is judgment on a world system, okay? And the body of Christ is taken out. The church, which is the body of Christ, this is the body of Christ, and uh, that's taken out, out of the world before this time comes. And like I said to you last time, there are some Bible teachers that say, okay, the rapture takes place here before the seven years. Some of them will say it takes place in the midsection, right here, three and a half years. And, and see, because at the three and a half year break, that's when this Antichrist breaks the covenant with the Jews. And he puts himself up in the temple and declares that he is God. He stops their sacrifices because they would have already restarted their sacrifices. And they had already rebuilt some kind of temple. See, that right now, they don't have a temple, do they? They don't have any sacrifices. They've got the red heifers. 
which is part of the sacrifices and the lambs, but they haven't been able to do that. And it looks like, and it comes up in my notes, it looks like that the Antichrist, at the beginning, he looks like he's bringing peace to the world. Peace, peace, where there is no peace. Remember we saw that. When they declare peace, sudden destruction comes. And so there's going to be a world peace right here, and, and along with that is world disarmament. <coughs> you see, you have world disarmament, and you have, except for the Antichrist and his armies, and some of the armies of other dictators, but you have peace, but at the very beginning, at this midpoint, he breaks it. And then he declares himself to be God, and that's when it's called the Great Tribulation. It's the tribulation that's called the Great. Jesus called, Jesus called it the Great Tribulation after that man of sin has presented himself in the temple. And, and Jesus quotes Daniel. He says, it's Daniel uh, chapter 9, verse 27, where it says, uh, and he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, uh, he tells them to flee Jerusalem, get out of the city. And so that's future. That, that was not 70 A.D. A lot of the teachers would say, oh, that's 70 A.D. It's not 70 A.D. at all. Uh, you no, know, no, it doesn't fit. 70 A.D. fits none of that. And so, all right, so let's go into this. You said, you said that there's an overlap. <coughs> I yeah. couldn't see from, because I... I in other words, this, I, this has to be right set there up. there at the start you know, of the tribulation where the overlap was? Yeah, he, set, he, said? Now he, set up, he sets up this world system, right? And so either that whole system of controlling the whole world has to start over here somewhere maybe, you know, in a mystery form. Right, okay. And then it becomes more obvious right here, but it becomes very obvious right here at the middle. That's when there's a manifestation of evil overtly. But at the beginning, it's more like peace. And, there, and it's a deception. It's a deception, bringing everyone under them. Now, there's some groups of people that will never be brought under the world system. And uh, I won't go into all that because they're not just not going, they're not going to cooperate with it. Tommy, uh, I, heard, I can't remember who this, if I read it or heard it from a pastor or preacher or something, but said that every generation that Satan has prepared an antichrist because he doesn't know when that church is going to be raptured. He doesn't know when all these times are going to happen mm -hmm. and it, that every every generation that he's yeah we could you, know, you could surmise that say that because in the, in first john second john third john he talks about there's many antichrists in the world there are many antichrists mm -hmm. uh, and so that's that, you know like that in other words that, that's already working we'll get to that in a minute because that that is part of this lesson so he says in verse two that you be not soon shaken all right so he's talking about uh in verse one He's talking about the Lord coming right here. And then he's talking about our being gathered together here. And in verse 2 he says, Be not soon shaken, all right? That you be not soon shaken or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us, as the day of the Lord is at hand. In other words, already present. And so the day of the Lord, he's saying, is not already present. It's not present back then. It's true that all the prophets of the Old Testament preached about the day of the Lord. They all had that. It was a gloomy thing. They always preached it because they knew God was going to judge the world system. And so it was always at hand. But here that verb there means it's already present. And uh, Paul says, no, it's not already present. It cannot be present until certain things happen. And one of the things that has to happen, uh, he, will, he, he gives two things that has to happen before the day of the Lord will be manifested like that. And so, look at the subpoints there and we'll get into this. Some believe and they taught that these believers were in the day of the Lord. And this is how they were explaining their extreme suffering and persecution. We probably would too. They failed to understand suffering in the church age as Paul had explained in chapter 1. Because, and we know this, and Jesus said it, Paul said it, that they that would live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. From the very, very beginning, the body of Christ has suffered persecution and is suffering persecution today. Now, we might avoid that because of our, you know, our, our world that we live, the government that we're under. We've, had, we've enjoyed a lot of privileges, wonderful things that other people in the world have not. And so, yes, Christians have been targeted for genocide. 
And I think of Nigeria, for one, because I kind of follow that, the horrible things that's happening to those people. But you don't ever hear about it because that, that's not as important as the narrative of CNN. You won't, you won't hear it. They've got their own narrative that they want you to believe. So look at verse 3. He says, Let no man deceive you by any means. Over and over again, don't we have that? Jesus said it. Paul said it. Here we... Don't be deceived. What does that mean? There's going to be great deception. And so he says, Don't let anybody deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come, away, come a falling away first. That's number one. And that that man of sin be revealed. That's number two. The son of perdition. All right? So we'll get to that in just a moment. But back up to verse 2, which I wanted to say something about. He says, Don't be shaken neither by spirit. Now that would be where somebody is uh, claiming to have the spirit and they're prophesying something. A, you know, somebody stands up and say that they're, the spirit said. Or by word. That's a message. Or by a letter from us. So those are three ways of deception. Those who are claiming to have the Spirit and they're prophesying something or some message or word or some letter that was falsified. You know, Paul had a problem with him falsifying things he wrote. And so finally he made an issue out of it. He says, this is how I sign my letters. Paul actually personally signed his letters where other people might have wrote them. He had secretaries, but he would end it up. He would write it himself. And, uh, and so, okay, those are three ways to be deceived. And so he says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Now, two things, and I put those two under subpoints, number one and number two. The first one is a falling away. And that's going to be important. It's hard to explain it to you, but it has the definite article in the Greek. So it's not a falling away, it's a the falling away. It's, it's got the definite article. When you have a de definite article in a text, it means something that if they're reading it, they know that it's an there's an antecedent to thee, something that they know about. And see, later on in, in verse, what is it, verse 5, he says, Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So, you ever do that when you're teaching, Brother Jenny? Mm -hmm. I told you all this a month ago. I told you all this last week. 30 minutes ago. 30 minutes ago, I told you. Yeah, we have trouble recalling that. Yeah, yeah we do. We do, and that's, that's hard for us, you know. And so Paul is reminding them, you know, I told you so. I told you this already. And so we know if he says that, that means we, we need to keep in our mind 1 Thessalonians because that's where he told us the things that was going to happen. You know, what did he tell us in 1 Thessalonians? Those believers were looking for the Son of God from heaven. They were waiting on Him. He told us in 1 Thessalonians that God had not determined that we would go into the wrath, but He would deliver us from the wrath to come. He told us that in 1 Thessalonians. And He told us about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians. It's the greatest passage on the rapture. But in every chapter in 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, He mentions the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The rapture. Talk about the rapture. But then when you, in chapter 5, he brings up the day of the Lord in uh, 1 Thessalonians. And now, in, in 2 Thessalonians, he's having to deal with that day of the Lord and how that's been confused. And we do get it, we, we mix it up today. Because when people talk about the Lord's coming, they never make that distinction that I put up here. These are distinctions. There's differences here. We have to understand that. Or otherwise, we are being deceived. People can write their books. They'll sell books. They'll sell movies about the left behind or whatever it is, all these different things. And people are just, you know, gullible and they'll just take it up because you don't, you don't know the truth. If I, if I cut the lights off, it was nighttime outside, no street lights, and we cut the lights off, but we, we would have darkness. And that in darkness, we can't, we can't see. And so we need the truth. And those who reject the truth, who have no love for the truth, they will be deceived. And they're the ones that's going to be lost. And we'll get to that. It's, it's coming up real quick. So let no man. So two things have to have to take place before this day of the Lord gets started. The first one is the falling away. It is a definite article. The falling away. Something that he's already mentioned. Uh, there has, I'm going to read this because this is a quote. Uh, there has been different interpretations offered. And really they has, there have been. So what is the fall, falling away? 
and I just mentioned this for you for your interest. I didn't know this till I learned it. In the earlier versions of the New Testament, before the King James Bible, this word apostasia is the word translated falling away, apostasia. Uh, it was translated departure. And it means a departure. It means a departure. And so because of that, and it was, it was translated departure, in other words, there was first a departure would take place. Thus, many understood this to mean that the church, which is the body of Christ, would depart before the day of, the, of wrath comes. And this departure is thought of as taking place through the rapture. All right, that's one thing. That's one way of looking at it, this falling away. Most commentators will say the falling away is falling away from the faith, you know, going away from sound doctrine, that kind of thing like Paul talks about in the last days of the church age. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, when Paul talks about the last days of the church age, yeah, there's a falling away, individuals and stuff. But what we're going to have here, right in here somewhere, there's going to be a falling away from anything and everything that has to do with God. And, and we can't imagine it today. We still have a lot of people in this world who believe we still have a great deal of great preaching in this world, Bible teaching in different groups around the world. And so we haven't fallen away. I mean, you can fall away. <laughs> Individuals can fall away. But as a whole, we're not talking about a world that's fallen away. Not yet. But now let's look at that next quote. And then I think you'll see. This was a good quote I found. Number two there. And... Uh, this man of sin has to be revealed, right? There has to be a falling away first, and then this man of sin has to be revealed. And then here's the quote. The day of the Lord cannot come until He has been made manifest. This man of sin. He will not be made manifest prior to the rapture. All right, now who is, who's saying that anyways? Doctor, uh, uh, I have, that's number, asterisk number two. So this is the addresses on the Thessalonians by Dr. Ironside. Uh, everybody knows Dr. Ironside. And this, this would have been mighty old because he's been dead a long time. He's like J. Vernon McGee. He's dead, but yet he speaks. He keeps on speaking every day all over the world on the radio. It's 1947. But let me read it to you now. The day of the Lord cannot come until he has been made manifest. This man of sin. He will not be made manifest prior to the rapture. But after the church has been caught away, when the apostasy of Christendom and Judaism will be complete, the vast throng of unconverted professors, that is those who profess to be believers and they were not, they left on the earth, that's the ones left behind, left on the earth, they will throw off all the pretension of allegiance to Christ and to God. They will be, they will be the complete falling away or apostasy, which will be the preparation for the reception of the Antichrist. I thought that was an incredible statement because this falling away here, right here, will make it possible for the, for the world to receive the Antichrist. And so as long as you have, as long as you have family, as long as you have Bible-believing people, you know, there's no way that the Antichrist could be received in the world because we're, we stand in the way of that. And so we have to be removed. And when we're gone, they're going to be glad we're gone because then they will be able to embrace that world system that has always been planned. It's always been in the planning, but it was never been able to be pulled off. There's always people who aspire to rule the world, but it's never been able to be pulled off. And it has, to, it has to be a falling away of, of all the, of the world, of that faith, you know. And so that's what we believe that to be. And that's the way I see it, too, is that, fact, that statement I just read. It's just beautiful. Because there's a lot of people, and, and he's talking about the church. There's an apostate church. That word apostasia, we use the word for apostate as well, apostasy or apostate. Yeah, there's apostate groups today, but the world would become that way. The whole world. You know, just think about it. Well, 
The days of the antediluvian world had come to that. And God who did what? He judged it with the flood. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah had come to that. He didn't leave one, one, not one of them survive. He burned them. He destroyed them. And if we read, if we read in the, as an example, if we read in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 32, you'll see again how people can so go away from every, every, vent, every vestige of truth and go ahead and, and develop the degeneracy that's in man. Until the point that God cannot cannot approve of their minds, and He'll take them away, and that's that's what Paul describes in great detail in Romans one. Uh, some people said, "Well, he was describing the antediluvian world," and others say, "Well, he was describing the Roman Empire." And so, but yeah, it, each generation comes to that point, uh, that tipping point, and you know where they're going to be judged, and it's going to go down nation after nation. You see, we've seen that in history. But we're talking now about a world, a, a whole world. The whole world will lie in that darkness. And that will give advantage to this, this antichrist or this man of sin to take his position. But as long as there's light, he can't do that. And so now number three there, sub point three, the whole subject of this context is the revelation of two persons, two personages, not one. The one is the man of sin in verse 3, and then that wicked one or that lawless one in verse 8. And see, we, I've always read that and kind of put them all together, but no, you got, you got to make a distinction there. There's two he's talking about. And that corresponds with the two beasts of Revelation 13. And when you look at the book of Revelation, you have two beasts. You, know, you have the Antichrist, what we call the Antichrist, which is that first one, and he's like the dictator, he's the, he's the main one. And then you have that false prophet who, who supports him and brings him uh, up in the light of all the people of the world. Through the false prophet does miracles and signs and wonders, you know, in order to support this other man. And, and then if you keep on reading the book of Revelation, you see when the Lord comes right here, the false prophet and the Antichrist, the Antichrist and the false prophet, and those who followed them are cast into the lake of fire alive. Wow, this is serious stuff. And so that's what Paul's talking about. And so we kind of keep those two in mind and we'll try to bring that out. Sub point four, this man of sin now is the same as the first beast of Revelation 13.1. He is to be distinguished from the second beast of Revelation 13.11. The first beast is typically referred to by the theologians as the Antichrist. That's why I keep saying we've got an Antichrist right here. All right, and then the second beast is known as the false prophet. Okay, I won't get into so much about it because some people believe that the Antichrist will be a Jew, um, and then there's other things about the Antichrist that you learn from the Book of Revelation that he will have a, he will be wounded, he'll have a head wound, it'll be healed. You know, that's that's the same one we're talking about. That's in Revelation 13 as well. So number five there, sub point five, the Antichrist will be revealed in two stages. Now this is really simple now. This, this part's going to be easy now. In other words, he's coming. See, but don't, don't be soon shaken. We, we're not going to be here when he comes. He's coming, and when he does come, at first, he will be revealed here and be extolled. He will be the one who has all the answers. He will bring world peace. And there will be disarmament. He will bring world peace. And so he is coming right here, presenting himself in the light that people can receive it. All right, so that's the first stage of it. And so under number five there, the Antichrist will be revealed in two stages. He is first revealed at the outset of the tribulation when he makes a covenant with Israel. That's Daniel 9, 27. And this agreement is to allow Israel to resume sacrifices at their reconstructed temple. But he breaks his agreement with, the, with them after three and a half years. All right? Halfway through the tribulation. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 27b reads this, quote, And in the midst of the week, remember that's the week of years, seven years, in the midst of seven years, that's three and a half, 
in the midst of the seven year week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. See, and at this point, he's in his second unveiling when he shows himself in the temple of the Jews and he claims that he is God. That's our passage in verse 4, which we're about to read. So at his first appearance, what does he do? He brings peace to the earth. And at this midpoint, he's unveiled as his real nature. He's a beast. He comes talking like a lamb. He winds up in his true nature a beast. All right, That's why he's called a beast. That he really is bringing destruction upon those who oppose him. So look at uh, verse 4. is talking about this Antichrist. And it says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. All right, that's, that's him at the midpoint now. That's at the midpoint. He doesn't do that at the beginning. He doesn't start right after the rapture and say, I'm God. Oh no, he's got it all. He, he builds this thing up, sets up his system, and then when he has the strength of it, he goes for the, the whole thing. And so that's what we're talking about there. And so he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. So I want you to think about this because I don't have time. We didn't have time to write everything out. This would have been a commentary in itself. But he opposes all that's called God. What is he opposing today? He's opposing life. He's opposing God, the sanctity of life. He's, he's opposing marriage, true marriage, a man and a woman, a family. They see that as, a, as somehow a, a hindrance to what they want to do. But whatever God has set up in God's institutions are freedom, marriage, family, children, uh, those kind of things, life itself. God has sanctified certain things for humans to have and to enjoy in life. And it's like, it's like almost like it's, everything's against that. And uh, if you read Romans 1, verse 18 through 32, you'll see every bit of it. Every bit of it is there. So he opposes and he exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, wow. Now, I'll tell you what. I give you the, the references to that in Daniel 7, 25, and Daniel 8, verses 9 and following, and Daniel 11, verse 36 and following. But I do want you to look with Je to where Jesus speaks of this in Matthew 24. So if you have your Bibles, go to Matthew 24, and we'll look. Matthew 24. And then we're going to start in verse 15. Matthew 24, 15. Okay. Here's what Jesus is saying. He says, when you therefore shall see the, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. All right? That's what we've been saying. That's what Paul talks about here. That's what Daniel talked about. It's an abomination standing in the holy place. It's one that abomination that Daniel talked about. And now he's set up in the, in the holy place. And then the scripture says, whosoever readeth, let him understand. You know, there's a little caution. Though. So, you know, you need to have some understanding here to understand. He's pointing you to something else beyond just the obvious. He wants you to go back to Daniel, I, I'm sure. And then verse 16, Jesus goes on and he says, Then let him that be in Judea, that's Jerusalem, Judea, flee into the mountains. Let him... That's Petra. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight, your fleeing, that your flight will be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then, see that word then? That's a time element. For then shall be great tribulation. This is Jesus. Then there shall be great tribulation, which 
as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now, that we, we know exactly when that is. It's right here. That's where it is. That's where he stands in the holy place. And he stops the sacrifices and he declares himself to be God. You know, Satan's always wanted to be worshipped as God. You know, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, he talked about his desire. You know, I will, you know, I will lift, I will lift up myself above the thrones of God and so on. I'll be like God. He told Eve, if you'll do this, you'll be like God. You know, so God knows if you do this, you can break his commandment, you'll be like him. Knowing good and evil. So, all right, so he, Jesus said, Great tribulation. And then uh, in verse 22, and he says, And except, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And he goes on and he talks about his coming. And I, we could just read it because it's just so clear. He goes on and he talks about his coming, which is right here. He talks about that. So he's going, he's talking in that Matthew 24, he's going from here over here to his coming. Okay. Very clear. And as far as the days being shortened, it seems like, you know, a lot of these people got it all figured out how many days it is shortened. But anyway, if it's shortened, it's in order to save the elect people's lives. The elects are those who are the elect of God during the tribulation. They're tribulational saints. There's going to be tribulational saints. There's going to be people who become true believers in the tribulation among the Jews. 144,000 Jewish evangelists for one thing. And then they preach. They preach all over the world. And their, and their preaching is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right here. It's at hand. It's coming. It's, it's upon you. And, he, and so there's a repentance. And then the everlasting gospel is preached by the angels right here toward the end of the tribulation. As we learn this in the book of Revelation. The everlasting gospel is this. Repent and give him the glory who created the heavens and the earth. Because the knowledge of a creator is absolutely gone from the earth. We, we, we've taken that away. I mean, we have Christianity today. But see, when the Christians are gone, there's no, there's no message of a creator. There's no message of a, of, of a divine one who came as a savior or of redemption or the blood or the, of the forgiveness of sin. All that's out of the way. And so you, know, you have to understand that's that great apostasy right here. That enables the whole world to adopt that man of sin and let him have his system. He sets up his world system right there. Okay, so this man of sin opposes and exalts himself above all this called God. That goes all the way back to Isaiah 14 too. And that is worship. So that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now the elect, the Jews who are going to be saved during that time, that's who he's talking to. He says, when you see that, Flee, the, flee Judea. Get out of Judea. And a lot of the scholars talk about them going to Petra, this, you know, the city that's carved out in the in the in the mountain and the, and the stones. It's absolutely empty. It's amazing that there was a civilization there and they're absolutely gone from it. And then God will prepare. This is Revelation uh, chapter twelve. God will prepare for three and a half years. He will take care of these people. That's Revelation twelve. Okay, now let's move on. Flip the, uh, get on the second page here. All right, now the next section talks about the restrainer. In other words, if all that bad stuff's going to happen, you know, where, who is the, who restrains? Who is, who is the restrainer? Who's restraining here? What's keeping that away? Holy Spirit. Okay, so we're going to get into that right now. All right, who's, who's keeping it away? So I put that at the top of the page. It says this. What keeps all this from happening? Okay, and Paul talks about this, verses 5 through 7. And I go on down through, all the way through verse 10 there. So let's read it. He says, Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So remember, Paul was only with them three, three weeks, right? 
but he taught them every day. Every day. They had, they had, when you had Paul, when you use him, and he was being taught, you taught him every day, all, a lot of these things. And of course, he said, don't you remember this? And then verse 6, he says, and you know. He says, they already know this. And he says, and you know what restrains. What restrains him now? Talking about this Antichrist. Who, who's restraining him? You know what restrains, uh, restrains him now. So that in his time, he will be revealed. Uh, that's the New American Standard, that part. It's his time. This is his time to be revealed right here. Right there. You know, or he's going to be revealed here. Remember, there's two stages of his. He comes here, but he comes like a lamb. But here, he's a beast. So he comes. There's a deception. And so, think about it that way for a moment. And then, yeah, the word restrain is kata echo. It's kata uh, echo. <laughs> that's the word that's translated uh, restrain uh, it's kat or kata which means down it means to hold something down and then echo means to have and to hold so it means to hold something or have something down to hold it down and therefore to restrain it okay okay and then in verse 7 he says for the mystery now for you see verse 7 he explains a little bit more for you see the mystery of iniquity doth already work that's the, that's the authorized version. I like that better. It says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he be taken out of the way. All right? So, let's think about that for a moment. Here's what the standard interpretation has been over the years. That the one that's restraining right now is like he mentioned, the Holy Spirit. All right, the Holy Spirit is a restrainer. All right, so, and the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way as a restrainer, not taken out of the world. The Holy Spirit's not going out of the world, but he will be taken away in that protected ministry that he has right now. So, yes, but then others have interpreted this as when the body of Christ is taken out of the way. Because the body of Christ in the world today is a great restrainer. It's a great restrainer. If you took the body of Christ out of the United States of America, what do you think Congress would be doing? They would have their way. They, these people would have their way. The corrupt people who are in this world will have their way. But we stand in the way. You know, yes. And doesn't it really just work together? Because well, sure. the ministry of the sure. Holy Spirit right now yeah. is what makes the body of Christ. Oh, yeah. So the, when the Holy the Spirit happens, the Holy it Spirit is, changes and we're gone. Yeah, the Holy Spirit and the body of Christ, that's how it is together, right? The Holy Spirit, body of Christ. I'm just saying the body of Christ, the believers, are restraining. The Holy Spirit has a, work, a restraining work as well. And uh, so let's look at these little subpoints here. That might be helpful. Iniquity, you know, we have, so we have two forms. And I, let's see, I, yeah, let's, let's do this just for a moment while we're still thinking on this. This is, there's, a, there's a mystery form of evil, right? There's a mystery form of evil. And then there's a manifest, a manifested form of evil. Right now, as, as Lynn said earlier, we have the mystery form. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. When Paul said that, that was 2,000 years ago. When John talked about that in his epistle, saying there's many antichrists that are in the world, yes, the mystery of iniquity, that mystery form of it, has been working all along. That's Satan's plan. Satan has been working his plan. You know, Satan has a trinity like God has a trinity. It's Satan, the man of sin, and the false prophet. You know, there's, there's the three right there, just the three. And of course, he has the demonic world. Of course, God has the angelic world. But uh, you have the mystery form, which is already working. And then you have the manifest form, which is the revealing of this man. So when Paul talks about the revealing, we've gone beyond the mystery form to a manifest form. It will be seen. It's, it's going to be outright. It's going to be overt. Right now, there's a lot of secrecy going on. Do you know that? There's a lot of secrecy going on 
among those people who are planning your grandchildren's future, whether they're going to live or die, for that matter. There's a lot of stuff that's going on behind the scenes. It's always been that way. I thought they promised to be transparent. <laughs> Sir? I was just being a little sarcastic. Yeah, but it's going to be transparent. <laughs> and you know, and, you know, it's kind of like that. It's like, it's like, you know, I heard this. I don't get off the subject because I have so much cover. But I heard this with my own ears, and I saw it with my own eyes on the news. They were interviewing a lady in the Ukraine. She was a, uh, an official, and, you know, they were pleading for our help. And she says, we're not only fighting for Ukraine, but we're fighting for the new world order. She said that. I heard that myself. Australia has been using that term all along, the new world order. They've been talking about the new world order all along. I guess they don't realize that Christians know what the new world order is. But they're getting real bold about it. Just come on, come on out. See. And, you know, thinking about getting bold about things, think about it now. When you were young, when I was young, there were certain things that were wrong. And what's wrong with that today? They're not wrong anymore. It's accepted. It's okay. No one will speak up against it. No one. You know? Honestly, I think if all our preachers in the pulpits across America would speak up, we could change our country. But they don't speak up. They don't say anything. We all know there's a lot of things that we should stand up against. Christians should take hold of what's good and stand up and speak up for what's, what's good. But, 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 but again, what I'm saying is that this is a mystery form and this is the intense form. This conflict will intensify right here because once the people that the large people are gone, then there will be an apostasy here that will welcome the new world order. So let's look at that real quick. Under under sub points five, one, two, three, four, five, real quick. Under verse seven. Iniquity has two forms, a mystery form and a manifest form. I put that on the board. Number two, Satan's possession of a human. You know, being possessed by Satan. Satan's possession of a human is found only before the church age and then found again after the church age. Before the church age, it was Judas. The only one that we see that Satan has entered into. I know Jesus called Peter, get behind me, Satan. But this is a real possession of Satan of a human being, Judas. And then, again, the man of sin. The man of sin is Anthropos. He is a man. He is a human man. He has a daddy and a mama. He's been born just like anybody else. But Satan enters into him in order to bring this about. Satan will enter into him. He is the man of sin. So you don't, so you don't think people now can be like possessed by demons? Not Satan. Not Satan. Demons, yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to get into that either. <laughs> yeah, people are possessed by you know demons. and okay. Demon influence or demon possession. Okay. But I'm talking about Satan. Okay. All right, and so... It is God the Holy Spirit, like Brandon said. It is God the Holy Spirit who prevents Satan from possession of a man. All right. After the, the rapture takes place, the Holy Spirit's protective ministry is completed. And it will be at that time that Satan will be permitted to exercise power to indwell a willing subject in the human race. And whoever that is, and well, he, I know where he's going. You know, I know where he's going. Uh, that would be the man of sin. And he would have entered into it. And what I was thinking there a minute ago, it's kind of offline, but it's something to think about. In fact, I think it comes up in Jude because the pastor's teaching Jude on Sunday night. I think it's in Jude. But anyway... Michael the archangel contended with Satan for the body of Moses. Why did Satan want the body of Moses? 
It's just interesting. A lot of people have their interpretation of all that, but the point is, uh, Satan is interested in some warm body that he can completely go into. You know. Now God was in Christ, wasn't he? There's a there's a hypostatic union of God becoming man. So Satan will enter into a man. He's a he's a copycat. He's an imitator. He'll have his son too. It's going to be his son, the son of perdition. And he'll be in that person in order to carry this out because it's going to take great intellect. Satan has great intellect. You know, he's not stupid. He's wise. But, he's, but also he's foolish in a lot of ways. You know, he's lost that wisdom. I mean, he has, he has great intellect, but he's lost that wisdom. He had wisdom. He was full of wisdom when he was created. And beauty, and, and all the, all those beautiful words about it in Ezekiel 28. But then when he sinned, when iniquity was found in him, he lost that wisdom. But he still has cunning and craftiness, and he's very wise, wiser than any man or any group of men. All right, verse nine, verse eight. Now he says, and then at that time, at that time shall the wicked one be revealed. Now. I'm contending that this is another person, another personage, which I pointed out earlier. Then shall that wicked one be revealed. Because you know, if you look at the book of Revelation, you're going to have two beasts. Not just one, you have two. This is the other one. That wicked one. And uh, be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the, mouth, with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him, this wicked one, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and lie, with all power and signs and lying wonders. I always say, what is a lying wonder? It's a wonder that lies. <laughs> it's a wonder that lies. It's a miracle that's a lie. But it's designed to deceive you, to get you into a, a narrative, to support what's being promoted. So in verse 10, he says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Now look, in verse 9, we had that wicked one coming after the working of Satan, doing all these signs and lying wonders. And then you have, in verse 10, people who, followed, who follow. These are the followers. And he says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. The ones perishing. And they're perishing for one reason. Why do people perish? They're perishing for one reason, and one reason only. Because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. All right? That's why people perish today, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You know? It's like, <clears throat> it's like John Piper said, I keep quoting him, I'm not a Calvinist like he is, and I'm not a covenant theologian like him. Uh, but here's what he said. It's remarkable. He said this is a very large conference. Thousands of people. Hundreds of thousands have heard him say it. He said this. He said, so you've made decisions for Jesus. Because he kind of puts down on the way we talk about making a decision for Jesus. And so, and so he says, so you've made, you've made decisions for Jesus. But he says, but do you delight in him? He says, if you don't delight in him, what makes you think you're saved? That's what he said. Now think about it. The scripture says there's one reason why people perish. What does it say? They receive not the love of the truth. We have to ask, do you love the truth? The truth is in Jesus, right? Receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. All right. That's good, isn't it? All right, let's look at these subpoints. We've got to hurry. I mean, always we've got to hurry, but let's look at this real quick. At the second advent, Christ will remove this beast from off the earth. And I wanted to read that. You circle it in there. You, you want to read that. Uh, Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21 tells you everything. Look, this is Revelation 19, right here. 19, 11 through 21. And this is what happens right here. Read it. Be sure and read it. All right, and then the wicked one's coming was according to Satan's power and plan. We read that. 
There, there is demonic deception operating right now during the church age, but it is in a restricted sense because the Holy Spirit is restraining, right? But after the rapture, the demonic deception will burst forth with an irresistible power. Those who are perishing, like in verse 10, those who are perishing are the unsaved multitude still living on the earth after the rapture. They had rejected the truth when it was available to them, resulting in demonic delusion. That's verse 11, which we're about to read. All right, Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. In these that perish, it is said, that in themselves were every form of unrighteousness. When one, of, when one rejects the light, he has only the darkness. One example of this degeneracy is the description of mankind in Romans 1, 18-32. You ought to read that too and you'll see exactly what he's talking about here. The last thing is this. Two verses last. The destiny of the unbeliever at the second advent. Verses 11 and 12. Verse 11. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion. All right, what cause? Because they didn't love the truth. If they didn't love the truth and they were not saved, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Notice that believing a lie is part of Satan's plan. Did you know that faith is part of Satan's plan? He want, you have to believe something to be a part of his plan. You have to believe a lie. You see, God's plan is to believe something, right? And Satan's plan is to believe something. You've got to believe something. All right, so this cause God shall send strong delusion that they should ask, believe a lie. Let me ask you, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, send, uh, send a strong delusion, does that mean allowing Satan to do his work? I mean, by sending it, does that make sense? Sending a strong delusion, mm -hmm. it just means that, that he is in charge, but he's allowing Satan to do allow, He's certainly he's allowing it. And that, that strong delusion is a process. And I think I, I put it in here. So let me go. And I, I think I'll cover that real quick. Look at the last verse. It says, And they, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Folks, if you go to Romans 1.32, you'll see that last verse of Romans 1.32. It says, Not only did they practice these things, but they had pleasure in those that did them. They knew it was wrong, but they, pre they had pleasure in those that did them. And here he says they had pleasure in unrighteousness. Had pleasure in unrighteousness. And they, he says that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. All right? Let's look at the sub points. And I think we can answer Liam's problem too there. These unbelievers had trusted a system of human merit and human self righteousness. That's always the case. Now, humanism. Number two, such a false hope cannot exist where the truth is admitted. If we admit the truth, certain things will not be accepted. You know, if you and I admit the truth and accept certain truth, we can't stand for anything else. All right, and then number three, the truth recognizes only God as the chief good. God is the only one good. Uh, and Christ, the God-man, the only Savior and the only object of man's faith in salvation. By rejection, by rejection of the truth, there follows the reception of the false. Without the defense of the knowledge of truth, members of the human race are helpless in avoiding the deceit of Satan's plan. Note that Satan's kingdom requires belief also, just like the kingdom of God. They have to believe a lie. Number six, from negative volition and hardness of heart comes a process of darkness and delusion. There it is. It starts off with rejecting. If you follow Romans chapter one, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. And they didn't want to retain Him in their thinking. And then you see the progression. There's three deliverances in Romans 1 into this degenerate state where God is absolutely going to judge them and wipe them off, you see. So from negative volition, and that's it, God consciousness, when the creation, God is the creator, Romans 1.18 says it, negative volition and hardness of the heart comes a process, there's the delusion, the process of darkness and delusion. This process explains the blindness of their hearts to the truth and of their being deceived by the false. The greater the evangelism, the greater the hardening of their heart. 
You see, when a person's hard in their heart, the more evangelism you give them, the harder it gets. Mm. That's always true. Even under the great, listen to this, this last point. Even, this has always amazed me. All the suffering that comes out of this tribulation, Revelation 6 through 19, they never cry for mercy. They won't repent. The message is repent. They won't repent. And so that last point there is even under the great judgments of the tribulation, they do not cry out for mercy. They repent not. And then you could see Revelation 16 that gives you a, a, a picture of that. Wow. Okay, I, I, this, this was just like a shotgun blast, I guess. And I, I hope that you'll coaster. think about That's it. That's what it was. Uh, just think about it. And uh, there's no way you can teach this on Sunday morning. You have to... Joan, you have to pick out something, and and uh, but here, this is the this is the bottom line. Be not soon sh- shaken. Don't let somebody lie to you, because we have a hope, and our hope is a blessed hope, the blessed hope of the co- of the Lord coming and our being gathered up to meet Him into heaven. First Thessalonians four thirteen to eighteen. Bob, would you lead us in our closing prayer? Father, we thank you for this time today. We thank you for the words of Tommy as he interprets your words for us and brings that message to us loud and clear, pure and simple, straightforward and unequivocal. Truth is there, and the battle continues between the truth and the lie. It is us, as our roles in our church and our roles in our community, to see that the truth shines through. We pray your blessings on all people in this world. We pray your blessings on those that need your care and support more than others. And in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we praise you and give thanks for your great gift. Amen. 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 Thank you.